Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this latest online sermon. So glad you're here. Um, we're praying that God will work powerfully through this ministry. And if he has, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us at impact at amazinglove at gmail.com. That's impact at amazinglove at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support this ministry and make sermons like this possible every week, please feel free to give online. There's a giving tab on our website. But now may God bless you through the preaching of his word. Thank you again for being here. You'll have to bear with me. We got a TV. <laughs> and just so you know, the emphasis of a TV is so that people who are watching online uh, can view uh, a little bit easier. Uh, with that, uh, let's just pray and ask God to bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, we're here to experience your great love and mercy. And so we ask you to show up in a powerful way. Rule over our hearts, guide us and direct us. Speak to us specifically through this powerful word so that we know what to do with it. In Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there is a problem with all joys and pleasures. And to set up the problem of a joy and a pleasure, I want to consider with you what it's like to experience a good meal. Let's say that you're this Friday night, you're going and you're having a date night at a great steak restaurant. You went on open table and you made your reservation, maybe for RPM steak, maybe for Smith and Walensky, maybe for Capitol Grill. If you're like me, it's Texas Roadhouse. And so all of Friday, you're thinking about sinking your teeth into that juicy steak. Maybe a filet. You know, you, you deserved it, right? Long week. And you, you're, you're itching in your cubicle to, to be done with work because of what's coming. Because you know it's going to be good. Well, let's experience that, that, that finally um, work ends and you go on the date. And it's as good as you thought it'd be. The service was great. The company was great. And that steak was delicious. Every morsel was juicy. It was done to your desired uh, temperature. Beautiful thing. But when your plate empties, you're approaching the problem. And the problem isn't paying the bill. The problem is that at one point or another, your joy or pleasure is over. You can't eat it again, although you wish you would. You have to go home, although you wish you could stay. And now all you can do is dream about someday getting back to there and doing what you just did because it's over. See, the problem with joy and pleasure is that it doesn't last. Isn't that true? It reminds me of the problem of every vacation, right? You can plan the great vacation, you can anticipate it for a year, and then you go there and it's as great as you, and you say, hi Mickey, and the beach is great, and the skiing was awesome, and ah, you know, and, but finally you have to come back. It's the problem with the weekend. You approach the weekend, and your team can win, and you can have a great fall day like we did yesterday, right? But sooner or later, Monday's coming. What's up with that, right? Except for kids, congratulations, Columbus Day, right? Hey? How about that? It's great. And so I wanted to propose this question. I wanted to ask, how, how well are you at holding on to joy? Would you say that your life is characterized with joy, or would you say that you are joyless? When people observe their life, would, would they say that you're joyful on the weekends, but not so much during the week? How are you doing with this concept of joy? And if you're saying, I'd like to have more joy or lasting joy, this is the lesson for you. And this is why it's good to be here. See, the genius of Jesus, he's going to teach us a path for joy. Let's look at verse 11. Verse 11, he kind of unearths what we're going to get into. Verse 11 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. That's pretty cool. Jesus says, my joy isn't in a steak. It's not in a filet done medium. It's in you guys. That's pretty cool. And then it says that your joy may be complete. It may be fulfilled. It may be lasting and it may be true. But to have this complete joy, to have something that sticks with us and, and we can hang on to it, a joy is going to be inseparable with something else. And let's talk a little bit about what inseparable means. You can have inseparable friends growing up. And inseparable means where they go, you go. Or, or, or siblings can do this. Where one child goes, the other child goes. Or, or you can have elephants, right? You know, cute little elephants where the one trunk goes, the other trunk goes. You're welcome for this one. God says joy is inseparable with something else. 
And, and what it's inseparable with is what he authored, and, and this thing that we call love, that he says, if you want to have joy, you can't have joy without love. They go together, and, and if you want to have love, you're going to find joy because they are linked trunk to trunk, arm to arm. In fact, we could say that the pathway to joy is paved with love. That's how we get there. So we get to consider what love is based on the words of a disciple named John. And, and John is maybe the best one to record these words of love because John was considered as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's going to record this here. So let's read from John 15 and we're just going to consider. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this why. So that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. My command then is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in the name of my Father will be given to you. So this is my command. Love each other. As I was researching this um, this past week about these lessons, the, the, the phrase came up to this, that, that true and lasting joy comes only from knowing and serving a loving Savior. So we've got to talk a little bit about what it is to know and then to serve a loving Savior. You know, sometimes by the essence of what marriage is, your spouse subjects you to certain things. Um, for instance, my spouse right now is subjected to a lot of Cubs, Go Cubs, right? You know, and, and I'm not sure my spouse would ever watch a Cubs game on her own because we're married. She knows what the Cubs are doing. She even knows Arietta, and I'm growing my Arietta beard now, so there we go, right? Well, because I'm linked to her, I learn of things that maybe I wouldn't have known otherwise. And, and my wife is into a bit of fashion. And it's only because of my wife that I, I know this uh, dialogue called uh, Who Wore It Best? Who Wore It Best? You know what I'm talking about? I've heard of Who Wore It Best? It's this idea that there can be one dress, but two different people wear it, and you need to figure out who wore it best. Here's an example of who wore it best. We have Carrie Underwood and Selena Gomez. And I'm trying to defend myself. The only reason I know this is, again, my wife, so that's where I'm trying to go, guys. Anyway, and so maybe you look at this and you can say, well, who wore it best? And, and I'm, not, I'm not sure who you'd choose here. I'm not really sure it matters. But I set you up to consider something else. Not who wore a dress best, but I want to consider with you, what does love look like when it's at its best? What is the best form of that? And I consider all the different ways we show love. In our household, I can show, show love in different ways, and, and chocolate and ice cream usually go really well. Chocolate, ice cream, cards, flowers, those are good. Um, I, I consider what my, my, my kids did and, and my girls did when they wanted to show me love. Uh, this last birthday, they had the Superman theme going on. And, uh, and, and, and with that, they didn't give me Superman, but they gave me this uh, Spider-Man mug. So every day I wake up with coffee, I can be like, I'm a superhero too, and that's what my girls think of me, and that's awesome. Not sure what love is in your household. In ours, it's a Spider-Man mug. Maybe for you guys, it's flowers and chocolate. I don't know. But if you want to see what love looks like best, that's what Jesus is going to get into that I think it's going to surpass a Spider-Man mug. Let's look at verse 13. Verse 13, he unearths what this is. He says, greater love is no one than this. It doesn't look any better than this. Than to lay down one's life for one's friends. To lay down one's life for one's friends. Now at this point, I'm a movie guy. It reminded me of a movie from the 90s. A movie in the 90s called Broke Down Palace. Now, this movie bombed at the box office. They spent $25 million to make it and only raised like $10 million. And you have Claire Danes and Kate Beckinsale. Uh, but the reason I bring this movie up is because of how it pictured what Jesus talked about today. Let me describe the story for you. It was of two teenage girls who told their parents they were going to Hawaii when really they went to Thailand because they could spend more money there. And while they're in Thailand, someone they meet uh, puts drugs in their carry-on, and they didn't know they were there, and so they get in trouble with drugs in their carry-on as teenage girls. 
At that point, they're thrown into a Thailand prison where the usual sentence would be life in jail with no connection to anyone else. They can't even tell their parents about what's going on. But the judge relented and they give each girl 33 years in Thai prison. Most of the movie is about their struggle, not being able to communicate and how are they going to get out and no one knows where they're there and all that kind of thing. But it culminates to one picture. It culminates with Claire Danes coming before the king of Thailand. And Claire Danes begs in a way that only Claire Danes could. She is sobby and emotional and just giving it all she's got to the king of Thailand, trying to plead and say, let me take both sentences. Let me serve 66 years so that my friend can go. Very emotional. Very dramatic. The king of Thailand agrees. And the movie ends with the friend going off in the cab and Claire Danes being stuck behind bars because she was willing to do this for her friend. Do you see how that relates to the story of Jesus at all? Do you see how why this movie bombed, that picture still stuck with me? We were under a prison sentence. Not 33 years, not this life, but eternity because of sin, because of what we did wrong, knowingly wrong. Yet Jesus enters into the equation. Jesus begs for his Father to let him trade places with us. And this is what the cross is all about. It's about trading places. It's this idea where I get to go free because Jesus paid my death. Dear friends, that's why we've gathered today. I want you to know you are free. You are forgiven because someone laid down his life for you. Someone was willing to trade places for what was yours. You are forgiven and set free today through Jesus. And God says this is what love was all about. About laying down your life. And so for us in response, we need to know love lays down its life for others. If you want to focus now on what love is, you need to know love is not about taking as it is about giving. Love isn't as much concerned about how I feel as how much you feel. Love isn't concerned about how my actions affect me as how much they affect you and how I can build others up. I remember being in men's group and they talked about this principle. They talked about how do you love your spouse? And they named it the paradox principle. It was a paradox because you had to die in order to live. You had to give something of yourself in order to properly love someone else. And so at this point, I just wanted to ask, if this is the way to joy, who are you laying your life down for? Who are you living in service of? Who is it that you're more concerned about how they feel rather than how you feel? This is how we have complete joy, our God says. But sometimes I think we can overthink who to love and how to love. Um, it it kind of reminds me of uh, the t-shirt gun guy at uh, a basketball game. I got the t-shirt gun guy. Now, the, the point of a gun is to get that, that t-shirt as far as you can, you know, into the third, you know, row. But what I'm saying is that if you're here in the front row, you're, you're thinking, it doesn't have to go to the third row. It just needs to go three feet. What about me? Am I mince meat? Just make it go here. So, so why do you worry about getting it so far away when, when I need a free t-shirt right in the front row, right, you know? Um, and, and go with me here. What I'm trying to say is sometimes we romanticize loving people we've never met, Right? I'm going to go away today and I'm going to love that person that I, have, I don't even know yet, you know? I'm going to find someone and this is who I'm going to, you know, love this way, right? And here's the thing about loving people you've never met. It's way easier to do that, <laughs> right? You ever remember not being married and dreaming about how awesome you'd be when you're married? <laughs> is that just me? <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to figure that out, right? It was much easier when I didn't know. And most of them were my problems. I don't mean to say anything about that, but anyway. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's so easy to romanticize following God's laws with someone that, that I don't even know yet, right? So what I want to do is just narrow it down, zero it down. Look, look at the front row of your life. That I think you don't have to think about the people you haven't met, but who's right in front of you? What are the opportunities right in front of you? And that's what I see in God's word. For here's another principle we learn in God's word. Verse 16. I love this. Verse 16 is... Um, you didn't choose me, I chose you, and I appointed you. I appointed you. Can we say that on the count of three? One, two, three. Appointed you. And the Greek is actually, I placed you. I put you where you are for a reason. 
You are in the exact community. You are in the exact family. You are surrounded by the exact people for a reason. It's not an accident. And it doesn't mean you can never move. It doesn't mean you can't take the job, but you need to know that it's not by random you're surrounded by the people you're surrounded by. That God placed you where you are to bear fruit. And and this is what I think we should do. We should appreciate today God's placement. We should say there are opportunities right now for me to do exactly what God is saying. We don't have to find our third cousin twice removed to, to show love to. We can find the people right in our pathway to lay down our life for and love. Appreciate the people God has put in your life. But the reality is it's easier to live for me than it is for you. The reality is sometimes we spend way more energy and emotion about what benefits me than benefits someone else. But I would say to you again, you won't find lasting joy that way. You might find momentary pleasure, but it will not last, says our God. More than that, I don't think you can properly live in relationship with a loving God who did this for us without doing that with someone else. How can we properly live in this relationship with a God who gave his life for us when we're not willing to to do anything for those around us? It reminds me, of a passage in Hebrews. In Hebrews it says, you have not resisted sin to the point of shedding your blood. It would just got in my mind, we don't try as hard as we might think sometimes to love and do what God says. So today look again at Jesus. Today look again that he didn't just shed his blood, he gave his life. Everything he got so that we would be benefited, so that we would be saved, so that we would be redeemed and be here. He is our Savior, and He is our pattern. So we talked about showing love to others, which will lead to joy. But now we need to talk about what it is to know love by God. And I want to know, you don't have to raise your hands for this one, but but have you ever had this thought uh, in your head, man, I wish I was in that household. Man, I wish I could do what they do. Man, I wish I had it as good as they got it. not sure what that is. Um, For us, I think our kids are very blessed. In fact, uh, they have me as dad, so of course they are. (laughs) But I think there's one area where maybe they would look at someone else's household and be like, man, I wish I had it like they have it. And this one area is where it comes to the tooth fairy. See, um, our kids are losing teeth left and right. One of them is stopped, you know, almost done. One of them is just starting. And so there's teeth galore. It's funny that they can eat anything, right? Um... And the tooth fairy in our household is pretty irresponsible. Let me tell you a story. The last time our our, our Bella lost a tooth, it took a month for our tooth fairy to show up. And we had to explain, you know, why we had a delinquent tooth fairy, you know, and just be like, you know, well, maybe we need a tandem tooth fairy thing going. I don't know, you know. And the problem was, I guess the tooth fairy doesn't carry cash. And the tooth fairy was a little concerned about leaving a Visa card. So the tooth fairy had to wait until mysteriously the tooth fairy found some cash. It took two months. Our child Nadia just lost her first tooth. And we hear of some elaborate displays of other tooth fairies about things wrapped in gold and little notes and sweet things. We just gave a dollar. Or at least our tooth fairy did, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and so they could look at someone else's house and be like, why don't, why don't I have that tooth fairy, right? I think we could experience this way when we talk about how we're loved. Why can't I be loved like that? Why can't I be cared about like that? Why can't that be my household? And if you've ever had that experience, ever had that feeling, why can't I be cared about and blessed and and cherished like that? God speaks into that this morning. Look at verse 9. He says, As the Father has loved me, which how awesome would it be to be loved by the Father? It's perfect love. He says, so I have loved you. Today is the day to confirm in your hearts you do have it that good. There is no one who has it better than you if you're under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. He loves you that well. 
And it made me think about what is it to be loved by the Father. He said, Jesus loves us like he was loved by the Father. And it made me wrap my mind a little bit about how God the Father showed love to Jesus. And there were two big occasions that God the Father showed up to Jesus. There was the baptism of Jesus and the transfiguration. At both the baptism of Jesus and the transfiguration, he had these words to say. Here's what he did to show love. He said, this is my son. So he claimed him. He said, you're not alone. You're mine. And I'm proud to be associated with you. It's my son. Whom I love. This is my beloved. Care for this dude. With him I'm well pleased, which is to say I'm proud of him. Proud of who he is. Listen to him, which could be described as he's good at stuff. Right? Why do you listen? Because he's good. He's a good teacher. Listen to him. He's good at stuff. So I believe, again, to be loved by the Father is to hear this. You're mine. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're good at stuff. You're mine. I love you. I'm proud of you. You're good at stuff. So what is it to be loved by Jesus? I believe it's to look to you and say, you're his. You see, he brought you into this family. And he says, son, daughter, welcome. He says, I love you. (laughs) And then you see, I gave my life. I don't know what else I can do to prove my love for you. He says, I'm proud of you. Don't you know that when you're in my fold, you're wearing my righteousness, you don't have to live in guilt and shame and fear. You live in confidence knowing that you are my child, holy and cleansed by me. And you're good at stuff. Don't you know you're my workmanship, that I put you here for a purpose, that you have good things you can do. And so today, God confirms into your heart, you're his He loves you. He's proud of you. And you're good at stuff. You're his. He loves you. He's proud of you. And you're good at stuff. In fact, why don't we just say that together? Let's just repeat this line together. Are you ready to say this with me? Let's say it. I'm his. He loves me. He's proud of me. And I'm good at stuff. Now, if that message would sink into us, down to the depths of our being, Do you think we would have reason for joy? I think so. For all of the times we feel down and out because we don't know if anyone cares for us. We don't know if anyone is there for us. When it feels like we are the only ones and so lonely in a huge world, God says, you're mine. I'm not kicking you out. You never left. I was always right there. In a world where people can't show us perfect love, And some of us are just jaded. God says, I showed you that love. In fact, my love never fails if you're looking for it. My tenderness, my mercies, they're always there for you if you look to me. In a world where we wonder, does he like the quirks and kinks that make up who I am? Is anyone okay with my weirdness and and, and, and who, who I am? God says, don't you know I'm proud of you? And if you've ever questioned your purpose, If you've ever wondered, are you making a difference? You need to know you are, you are, you are because you're his craftsmanship. And he makes every tool differently, but you are a tool by the hand of God to be used in this world. You will make a difference through him. This is what it's to be loved by the Father. To live in his love. But there's more. I was doing research about this lesson and there was a commentator who said this about what it is to be loved by God. He said no matter what the believer experiences as he travels through life on his way to heaven, no matter what, that's like all circumstances. Anyway, he has the assurance that his Savior is dealing with him in love. And for us who know Romans 8.28, that he works all things for the good of those who love him, isn't that true? We can have joy when we know that. When I have a setback and a heartache, when when I have something not go my way, I can have joy if I know there is no instance where he's not dealing with me in love. I found a great picture on Facebook this past week. Picture that our member put up there, it was was this. It said, be still and know, not freak out and question. I love it. I love it. And I just wonder, how in the world do you do this if you don't know this, (laughs) right? How is that possible if you don't have other knowledge about the love of God, which is for every moment? How can you rest and find peace if you don't know he's going to work everything, everything for your good? And this is what it's like 
to be loved by God, to have that knowledge. I can be still and know. I might not have all the answers, but I do know he loves me and he's dealing with me in love and you're not going to convince me otherwise. But there's this progression of love. You see, if you read the lesson, it's like the Father loved me and then I loved you and now you're to love others. The Father loved me, and then I loved you, and then you're to love others. It's contagious. That's what God's love is supposed to be like. It's contagious. Kind of reminds me of flu season. Welcome back flu season. You know what it's like to have the flu. And if one guy has it in the household, uh, they pass it down to the other. And, and, and how great it is to just be contagious. It reminds me of a, a Skittle commercial. You seen this one? And, and, and the girl eats a Skittle off his face, and that's gross. And then she says, is this contagious? And guess what? It sure is. And so what I'm saying is that God's love is supposed to be contagious, and and these, I think, are supposed to be your marching orders based on my interpretation of God's word. And I get to interpret his word, so this is what you're supposed to hear. Go infect someone. Right? Isn't that uplifting message? Be infectious, people. Not with the flu and not with Skittles. Show them what it is to be loved like the Father. Because Jesus showed us that love and it reigns in our hearts. Grab them by the shoulders and let them see the face of Jesus in you and how you operate and what you say to them and how you serve them, how you lay down your life. This is what we are to do. We are to affect the people around us, and that's going to be incredible for our outreach. Infect them with just love. What can God use of me to benefit you? How can I show you the face of God on how I lay down my life? Because that's what my Savior did for me. Go infect people. It's good. It's way better than the flu, too. But how do we do this? The genius of Jesus is really seen in this whole chapter. And in this whole chapter, he sets out a brilliant illustration. He sets out this illustration that we are the branches and that he is the vine. And so I have this illustration before you. And I'm not good with rose bushes. I kill stuff. But I want to illustrate something for you. Let's say we cut off a certain branch. And to this branch that I have just cut off, and play with me here, um, do I expect it to grow any more roses? Not at all, right? What if I really motivate it? Like, what if I say, there's been no branch like you, and you think the other branches are good, they haven't met you yet, and you can grow a rose, right? What if I motivate it? No? What if I threaten it? What if I say, you're in big trouble, mister, if you don't grow a rose? You don't even know what's going to happen to you. When dad comes home. What if this, this branch is internally motivated? What if it just operates by this rule that says, I have confidence in me. Because what I set my mind to do, I can do. And they don't even know I am going to grow a rose. I'm just going to be so internally motivated and ready to go. They don't even know, right? You can yell at a, at a branch cut off, and it can be internally motivated, but the only way it's going to grow a rose is if it stays connected to the rose bush. It's good. It's good. We're concerned about how to love people. And I'm yelling at you, and maybe you're being internally motivated. But maybe the real solution isn't about either of those things. Maybe, as Jesus said, the way to produce this fruit really isn't about how motivated we are or how much I yell at you, but it's more about just staying connected to the rose bush. That's what Jesus said. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And Jesus would say that, that apart from me, you can produce no good thing, but with me, you will bear much fruit. What if, what if loving each other, it's more simple than, 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 than we realize. What if it's just about how we remain in Jesus? Because eventually that love is going to spill over if we're filled up enough. Eventually, seeing Jesus will change us and change others because it's contagious. So remain. Remain. And may you experience the joy that God told you you could experience the true and lasting joy, not the transitory, the stuff that lasts for an eternity as you love others. Amen. Please stand.